This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole. As the crisis in Ukraine intensifies, we'll hear from both sides as we consider just how the conflict might now play out. It's now more than three weeks since the first Russian troops moved into Ukraine. And while there have been some diplomatic efforts to end the crisis, a peaceful conclusion still seems a long way off. Well, joining me now from Moscow is Sergei Markov. And Sergei is once a member of the Russian Duma and a former public spokesperson for President Putin. Mr. Markov, we're now several weeks into this war. It hasn't unfolded, has it, the way President Putin thought it would? Uh, I think that a military operation is going uh, not so quickly as uh, it was expected, because we expect that, we know that in uh, 2014, uh, on the, uh, those part of Ukrainian army who stay in Crimea uh, took Russian side uh, by 87 uh, percent. And we believe that a big part of the uh, Ukrainian army also uh, also will take uh, a Russian side as this, but it's appear to be uh, not, and the Ukrainian army under the uh, full control of the generals who uh, under the control of United States uh, and British uh, officers, and they are really uh, fighting. But nevertheless, uh, military operation is going on. I should recall you that Americans uh, take control of the Raqqa. Uh, in Iraq. It took uh, from them uh, to them uh, two months. It but has uh, Ukraine is much more bigger than Raqqa, and yes. Ukraine is much more bigger than whole Iraq. So maybe this operation will take two or three, uh, uh, two or three months, and probably four months. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, Russian army will win, uh, first of all, because the Russian army is more strong, and secondly, because majority of Ukrainian people support not Ukrainian army, but they support Russian army. Earlier this week, I spoke to the former Ukrainian Prime Minister, Alexei Honcharek, who gave me his take on President Putin's tactics. His plan was to take uh, our capital, to capture our capital, to kill our president, and to install uh, the puppet government in Kyiv in a couple of days, first couple of days, and he failed. Uh, Ukrainians uh, uh, are very brave and they are fighting uh, against uh, Russian invaders uh, in all uh, possible uh, ways uh, in all uh, regions of our country. Uh, Putin decided uh, to change the tactics. He understood that he can't uh, destroy our army, our Ukrainian troops, and he started uh, destroying uh, our civilians, our cities. What do you make of that? Russia, uh, Russian plan from the beginning was not taking control of the big cities, and of course not taking control of the uh, uh, Kiev uh, city. Russian plan was uh, to uh, surround the biggest group of Ukrainian army, which it stay in uh, Donbas, and that is what Russian army is doing. Then, uh, Russian army is surrounding all the uh, big uh, cities uh, of Ukraine and waiting when anti-fascist. Uh, step by step, probably uh, will take uh, power in those cities. If uh, anti-fascists will be too weak uh, to take uh, fascists out, uh, out of power, Russian army will uh, help us civilians. Uh, we want to save them, not only because we are humanists, but because it's our people. He went on to talk about Ukrainian military resistance. In Ukraine, not only our troops, not only our army, not only our like military military troops uh, are involved into this war. It's a war of all our nation. So even I'm a civilian, but I have a gun. I never had a gun before, uh, and now I have a gun, and I'm ready to fight, uh, like physically. Uh, in Kyiv if, uh, if uh, it will be necessary in the coming days. But it's not enough. 
it's not enough. We pay, we are paying a huge price for your freedom, guys, for your freedom. And we are only a first, a first goal of Mr. Putin. He will go uh, further. Are you surprised at the level of resistance against the Russians? Uh, uh, for us, uh, it was uh, uh, partly a surprise that uh, Ukrainian armies uh, fight it more strong uh, than we uh, predicted before. Uh, it was a uh, uh, surprise. It's absolutely uh, right. Uh, it's not a uh, majority of Ukrainian people. Is there any way diplomacy can end this war now, or has it gone too far? It's very easily. Uh, there are only one guy who can stop war tomorrow. It's President of the United States, Joe Biden, uh, which, is, uh, which officers fully control Kiev repressive regime. Russian demands is very, very easily. First of all, uh, all political prisoners should be liberated in Ukraine. Uh, then all neo-Nazi group should be prohibited. All war crime criminals should be arrested. And uh, well, the, the problem is, the, the problem is Russian that the language. West is accusing Russia of committing war crimes. It's falsification. I'm saying about serious thing. During negotiation, believe me, American, even American diplomats don't talk about uh, war crime from Russia's side because uh, they know that it's not true. And uh, uh, but uh, I continue Russian mind. Prohibition of uh, neo-Nazi groups, disarmament of neo-Nazi groups, stopping of political terror and political repression, liberation of all uh, political prisoners, Russian language as a uh, second official language in uh, uh, Ukraine. All war criminals should be arrested and uh, uh, should be uh, uh, under the, uh, investigation and the neutrality of uh, Ukraine in the uh, uh, Constitution. So as uh, uh, in Austria, after World War II, uh, neutrality of Austria and uh, uh, big uh, country became the guarantee of its uh, neutrality. Same okay. time uh, should be uh, for Ukraine. Right. Tomorrow... You yourself have said President Putin had been lying for several months in the run-up to the attack on Ukraine. So can we really believe anything that's coming out of the Kremlin at the moment? Uh, yes, because I will tell you the truth. All politicians are lying. Including Russian politicians? Including Russian politicians. Russian politicians like less than American ones. And President Putin, um, how far will he go? Vladimir Putin... I think uh, we'll uh, liberate a thousand Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, Central Ukraine, uh, but not Western Ukraine. As Western Ukraine, uh, probably we prefer to have uh, uh, be neutral uh, country, as already mentioned, in right. Austria or, or uh, Finland, because we know very well that uh, people on the Western Ukraine does not like Russia. But people in the south and in eastern Ukraine like Russia very much. All right, Mr. Markov, thank you very much for joining us here on the agenda. Most grateful. My pleasure. Still to come here on the agenda, has Europe's reliance on Russian oil and gas only escalated the crisis in Ukraine? We'll get the view of the former Prime Minister of Lithuania. Have you ever wondered how much a human life is worth? Have you ever looked up at the night sky and considered whether aliens are staring back? Or if it's even possible to measure intelligence? If that sounds like you, it's time to join The Answers Project with me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. We've recruited the best brains in the world, award-winning astrophysicists, giants of medical science, and former presidential advisors to help us tackle humanity's biggest questions. Find The Answers wherever you get your podcasts. Events have consequences. Words create impact. Unprecedented scenes that we saw. Hello, the cleanup operation is now well and truly underway. Parts of southern Europe remain in a state of emergency. Context gives meaning. People make history. 
far more than a thousand people have come here today. But authorities are still on high alert. So now we've actually become the border on this road. A complex world demands a comprehensive view. But with the cleanup efforts more or less under control, the economic impact is bound to ripple across the country. There's plastic pollution everywhere. Because the world today matters for your world tomorrow. This is the living area of the crew. The focus is family on future technologies. Well, this is something completely different. The world today, every day on CGTN. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. It's the first day in Germany that vaccination centers like this one are offering a third jab. There are fears there could be a fifth wave of COVID-19 cases. Market watchers have a keen eye on infection rates. Safety and efficacy of COVID-19 shots. France closed schools in the first lockdown in spring last year. France has been a leader is in vaccinating youngsters. If a spike necessitates another lockdown, Italy is now close to reaching its target of immunising 80% of the population over the age of 12. Welcome back to the agenda. Before the break, we heard from Moscow and Kiev about the current state of affairs in Ukraine. But just what role can the rest of Europe, especially the European Union, play in bringing about a solution to this crisis? And are many of the current difficulties actually caused by Europe becoming too reliant on Russian oil and gas? Well, joining me now from Brussels is the former Prime Minister of Lithuania and current MEP, Andreas Kubilius. Andreas, we're now several weeks into this conflict in Ukraine. Where do you think we stand now? My conclusion is very simple. He is losing that war, both in the military sense in the territory of Ukraine and also in economical sense back in Russia against uh, very tough uh, Western sanctions. What is the point of sanctions? Are they to force Mr Putin to the negotiating table, to punish Russia for starting the war, or are they designed to perhaps uh, bankrupt Mr. Putin's war machine? Well, I would say the last point is perhaps most, you know, precise. Really, it's the way in which the West can stop this, you know, war machine. Really, uh, first of all, you know, sending very clear message that if the war will continue and if Putin or his, you know, surrounding are imagining that they will be able to occupy you know, new territories in Ukraine, that they will fail because those sanctions will stay. And the sanctions are even without, you know, embargo on oil and gas are very painful. I hope that, you know, all the West also will uh, will introduce uh, sanctions uh, on, on import of gas and oil, and that will be, you know, additional blow to Russian economy. And, uh, and, and that is how, you know, uh, we hope that, you know, in Russia, in Russian authorities, in Kremlin, they will start to understand that they do not have money even to continue the war. Do these sanctions go far enough? Well, I would, you know, I called in the European Parliament, uh, you know, uh, to sign the common letter of uh, members of our own parliament, 
we collected more than you know 100 uh, signatures, which is quite a lot uh, in according to to you know to European Parliament traditions during a few days. Where we called you know full embargo on oil and gas. Uh, you know, I mean to stop imports of oil and gas um, uh, from Russia into European Union. Because the numbers which we see now, you know, which are published by different think tanks, including Bruegel think tank, are really uh, raising very, very big moral question. Each day, the European Union is paying into the pockets of Putin somewhere around of 600 million euros per day for oil and gas, mainly for oil. And uh, if, uh, as we asked, you know, some experts on Russian military technologies, and we asked a very simple question, how, how much one new tank, uh, what is the cost of new tank? The cost is around 1.5 million. So it means that we are paying, you know, per day for 400 new tanks uh, to be, you know, acquired by, by, by Putin, you know. And when we see that during the war, during two weeks of the war, you know, uh, uh, brave Ukrainian soldiers managed to destroy, you know, somewhere around of 390 tanks, and we are per one day paying more than they managed to to destroy during two weeks. I think that we cannot continue with, you know, paying into the pocket of Putin, you know, in such a way anymore. So that's what what we need to introduce. Has this invasion of Ukraine led to a rethink about European energy policy? Uh, not just at EU level, but for the UK and all the other countries in the in the region. Definitely, you know, energy is a topic which we are discussing very much. And you know, I said why we need to you know stop uh, import of gas and oil immediately. Uh, from another side, definitely we need uh, to uh, look into the strategies how to become you know independent from Russian gas and oil supplies, looking into a longer term future which, you know, there are some, some plans recently announced by Commission. And in addition to that, of course, uh, you know, what was decided by, by European Union and by Commission, by Parliament, by the Council during uh, the last years uh, to implement so-called Green Deal, you know, in the fight against climate change, that becomes, you know, really even more needed to be implemented as soon as possible. Uh, because that will uh, definitely will make you know Europe uh, totally independent from gas and oil, and our energy our energy production will be based much more on uh, alternative you know energy production. Well, that leads to the question: Did Europe become too reliant on Russian gas and oil? Well, that's for sure. It's it's no doubt you know. Uh, in gas, you know, we are buying now, the whole Europe was buying around of 42% of gas was imported from uh, from Russia. In Germany, the numbers even are higher, you know, at around of uh, 54%. And definitely our, you know, I would say illusion that uh, having such kind of trade relations with Russia, it will make also Russia to be more, you know, uh, adaptive to European type of behavior. Those illusions are gone, and uh, uh, definitely, you know, uh, put in use those. Uh, where should uh, where, where should Europe look for their energy now? Then where should it come from? Well, first of all, of course, there are some reserves which we you know of gas, which which we are keeping in our storages, and uh, so as at least what the European Commission have said. Ursula von der Leyen recently have said that, you know, they, again, they made a, a quick research on, on situation. And, and the answer is that even if Russia will, or Putin will stop uh, gas deliveries to Europe because of, you know, of the war which he started, even then, uh, for this season, we are on the safe side. I mean, the reserves are enough. Uh, you know, and uh, and uh, there is no no we should not fear that you know uh, European economy will be stopped because of that. Of course, the prices can rise it's up. Go it's we certainly going to damage it uh, tremendously, not least inflation, isn't it? Uh, and Nord Stream two was the big hope for Germany. Now Germany is talking about putting net zero perhaps on the back burner, and they're building LNG terminals. Yeah, that is one 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 way what we can do in Europe, you know, really to build LNG terminals in order to get, you know, access to global, uh, you know, shale gas market. That's one thing. Uh, second, of course, implementation of Green Deal and, and, and diminishing, you know, the need of gas also is, is very much needed. 
So I don't see why we should not implement immediately, you know, uh, embargo on oil and gas in such a way, stopping, you know, first of all, the war. How and do they feel it, in Lithuania? Well, of course, we are, we are, you know, first of all, we are very much, you know, in solidarity with Ukrainian people and Ukrainian soldiers. We are delivering them weapons. Second, we are, you know, improving our defense capabilities and NATO is, is sending, you know, more and more troops into into Lithuania, into the Baltic states. So we are ready for whatever, you know, developments. But I do not see how Putin can win that war because now he's losing the war in Ukraine. Now, you know, Europe and the West is coming with much more support. Uh, do you feel um, that Mr. Putin understandably felt threatened because he had NATO so close to his borders? Is there a case for saying NATO should not have been so forceful? Well, it's total wrong, you know, language which Putin was trying to use in order to, uh, in some way, to argue why he, he needed to go to the war. Because, first of all, NATO is a defense organization. NATO is not threatening anybody. Ukraine is not a member of NATO. And, uh, you know, and uh, to, to demand that Ukraine will, which should not improve their defense capabilities. And put, when Putin went and occupied Crimea back in 2014, it's something, you know, totally uh, difficult to understand. Do you see Ukraine being allowed quite quickly into the EU and NATO? Uh, well, first of all, about EU, I definitely I would like to see that things would move uh, very rapidly. There is for formal application from President Zelensky, you know, where he asked uh, to start, you know, membership procedures um, uh, for for Ukraine to become member of EU. Uh, so I hope that candidate status will be given quite soon, you know, with a positive uh, evaluation from Commission. On NATO, uh, I am. Uh, well, first of all, formally, Ukraine did not ask for such kind of membership. Ukrainian government and Ukrainian political elite, uh, they understand uh, reality that perhaps in the nearest future, NATO will not open the doors for, uh, for Ukraine. But uh, Ukrainians are looking, and President Zelensky, he spoke very clearly that they want, you know, real security guarantees uh, from, you know, uh, the countries uh, which can give such guarantees. Unfortunately, the guarantees which were given back in, in uh, 1994 in so-called Budapest Memorandum, which, were, which was signed by, by Russia and by Americans and, and, and Great Britain and some other countries, they were unfortunately not real guarantees. So uh, definitely for Ukraine, uh, there is a need of real guarantees. You know, security guarantees uh, and, of course, uh, possibility to develop their own security uh, infrastructure. Uh, and uh, I would say in a, in a very clear way that Ukrainians have shown that they are really, you know, the strongest European nations. They are fighting for European values in such a way which is incredible. And they have the strongest military forces on European democratic uh, continent. And that is why I would say that, uh, you know, both EU and NATO would be strengthened if uh, Ukraine would join those organizations. Andreas Kubilius, a member of the European Parliament, former Prime Minister of Lithuania, many thanks for joining us on the agenda. Thanks a lot. Still to come here on the agenda. <laughs> Raising morale, we'll find out how one of Ukraine's biggest rock stars is working to help his countrymen. It's the first day in Germany that vaccination centers like this one are offering a third jab. There are fears there could be a fifth wave of COVID-19 cases. Market watchers have a keen eye on infection rates. Safety and efficacy of COVID-19 shots. France closed schools in the first lockdown in spring last year. France has been a leader is in vaccinating youngsters. If a spike necessitates another lockdown, Italy is now close to reaching its target of immunising 80% of the population over the age of 12.
Welcome back to the agenda. Millions of Ukrainians have now fled the fighting, but millions more across the country are being forced to take shelter from the bombing by going underground. One such person is one of Ukraine's most famous rock stars. He's a politician, activist, and lead singer of the band Arkian Elsie, Sevastislav Vakarchuk. And he joins me now from Kharkiv. Can you tell us whereabouts you are at the moment? Actually, right now, I am in the eastern city of Kharkiv, which is right now bombed by Russian army, and we are in an improvised impromptu bomb shelter, which is right in the underground. So imagine you're in the an underground in London, and it's a bomb shelter. It's typical. So where are we now? And people around me are actually having a shelter here. What, what is morale like where you are? The morale is very good. People are calm. Uh, people are focused. Uh, you can see a lot of ordinary people. You can see even small babies here. And uh, some of them are literally being born here. So this is completely ruined of a normal uh, course of life. But everybody is absolutely determined to, to stay together till we win. You recently because joined the Ukrainian I, army. Why did you do that? Because I think it's my obligation to defend my country. And millions of Ukrainian uh, men did the same thing, territorial self-defense or army, because I had my previous uh, training as an army officer, I did it. I mostly uh, now fight with my, with my voice and with my words, but if necessary, I'll certainly will be ready to pick up the gun and fight. And what have you been doing since you joined up? Mostly supporting people like these. They need support in every, in every, every city. They need somebody uh, who they know to tell them that everything's going to be all right. I meet people in, uh, uh, in different cities, uh, army officers and soldiers. We go to hospital, we bring some aid. And not only me, there are many other people. Like uh, over there, there is a famous Ukrainian poet, Sergei Zodan. He's over there. Uh, he's very modest. The guy who actually will is now nominated for the Nobel Prize from Ukraine. So wow. he's next to me, and you can see him. And he's my friend, and we are together. You're a very famous musician. You're a rock star. Uh, can music help? Has music helping you cope and other people cope? It's not time for music, but generally people listen to the music that, they, that pumps up their mood, and they are, uh, it helps a lot. But now the most help we need, it's not music. It's anti-missile defense systems and planes and closing the sky over Ukraine. This is the help that we need now. And then, when we win, we'll have a lot of music. You've been posting messages to your many fans in Russia uh, over the past few weeks. What have you been saying to them? Uh, it's very difficult to say some, something to people who are afraid of going out to the streets because they're afraid of being arrested. Our people are being killed, so we're not afraid to fight against the enemy. You're not only a musician, you're a former member of the Ukrainian parliament, aren't you? Uh, how much uh, room is there for diplomacy now? Uh, uh, even if we have one chance from 100, we need to do it. But uh, while we are thinking about diplomacy, our army needs to be ready to fight. And do you think there is room for diplomacy even as Ukrainians fight back? Uh, it's always room for diplomacy. Uh, sooner or later, every war finishes with diplomacy. What is your message to the people of Ukraine? The message uh, to everybody in Ukraine is we are together, we are fighting together, and we shall overcome. It's inevitable, because we are fighting for justice and for our land. Svetoslav, many thanks to you for joining us on the agenda. Thank you very much. Don't forget you can watch everything from past Agenda episodes and find additional exclusive content on our website, cgtn.com slash Europe or on our YouTube channel. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at CGTN Europe. Coming up on a future Agenda, a question of sanctions. Will finance be the only way to end the conflict in Ukraine? But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team, it's goodbye.